Let's open our Bibles, uh, because this is the most important thing that we could do. Uh, we're going to open one last time to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you and you want to grab uh, the one that's right in front of you there in that rack, you can turn to page 61. That's where you will find our passage this morning. Um, this, is, this is what we're all about as a church. Uh, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God himself. Uh, we, we don't believe that what I'm about to say matters unless it agrees with what God has said in his word. We want to be a, a community of believers that are completely dependent on the word of God. Uh, this is his truth. Uh, this, this is what changes lives. Uh, this is why uh, we have testimonies to share. Uh, this is why we get to celebrate baptism, because our hearts and our lives have been changed by the truth of God's word. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the Bible says. So what the Bible says needs to become what we think. And, and, and you might not be there yet. You might not be sure what you believe about the Bible, but we just want to put our cards on the table uh, this morning. If you believe that the Bible is the word of God, then that has a significant impact on the rest of your life. Uh, there's an authority over our lives. And, and, and so we just want you to see God's word for yourself today. We are wrapping up uh, our series, Walking Through the Ten Commandments. And our desire uh, for this series has been that God's commands would reveal his character and that our salvation would result in our submission. And as we have gone through the series, we've just kept at the forefront of our minds that for those of us who are in Christ, we're not under the law. Uh, we are under grace. And, and that's the very best news because the revealed law of God was never intended to be what justifies us. The law of God was never intended to be what we point to to prove how good we are. I've done this and this and this and this and this. Look at me. No, no, no. No, no. The law was intended to reveal our need for someone else to be righteous in our place. Uh, and, and, and this final commandment enables us to really get to the heart of this series. So we don't have a whole lot of time this morning, um, but we're going to go back up one more time to Mount Sinai, and we're going to hear the words of the Lord our God. This is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. If you don't believe that verse, the next 15 don't matter. Uh, because if the Lord is not your God, then you will choose to listen to a different authority in your life. Right? If, if, if God, does not expect us to, God does not expect us to serve him until we've been saved. Right? We are saved so we can serve. Uh, salvation precedes the law, not the other way around. So if the Lord is your God, then what he has to say should matter very much to you. And this is what he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Those first four commands are about our vertical relationship, our relationship with God, summarized by Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The last six commands are about our horizontal relationships, our relationships with our neighbors, with anyone that we come into contact with, starting with our parents. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or in case you find a loophole somewhere, anything <laughs> that is your neighbor's. You didn't say this. No, no, no. Anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not 
covet. Perfect timing for this command on the Sunday between Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Wouldn't you agree? We're not going to covet this holiday season, right? We're not going to do it. We are about to get an onslaught of Christmas commercialization. Are you guys ready for that? Uh, I always say that my favorite holiday is Thanksgiving just because I feel like Christmas is so over-commercialized and it's just, it's just so much, especially when we know the true meaning of Christmas and what it's all about. And next week we jump into a series on Christmas, uh, so I hope you join us for that. But we're going to be prepared for this onslaught of commercialization and we're not going to covet. covet. Coveting is craving. It is, is yearning for what belongs to someone else. I would describe it as envy's older brother, because covetousness desires what the other guy has. Envy is angry the other guy has it. Uh, and, and as we have with each command, we start by seeing what this command reveals about God. And it's not just the revelation of this command, but really a revelation that is central to the Bible, which is this, God wants our hearts. God wants wants our hearts. The 10th commandment makes explicit what the other commands imply, which is this. God requires both inward and outward obedience. God requires both internal and external obedience. Because while a majority of these commands, especially the second half of the series, they're forbidding a specific outward action, right? Do not lie. Do not steal. Do not, do not, uh, do not uh, commit adultery. Uh, this command is not forbidding an external behavior, but an internal one. Right? This, com- this last command goes to the heart, forbidding an internal desire that could lead to poor external behavior. So, see, people often break the 10th commandment before breaking other commandments. Right? Coveting leads to stealing. Coveting leads to committing adultery. Coveting often leads to murder, yearning for what belongs to someone else. And this is what makes God's law different from man's law. Because all man's law can do is restrict and modify external behavior. Right? This is one of the frustrations with parenting, is we wish that we could change our children's hearts, right? But all we can do is really restrict, modify their external behavior while we pray that God changes their hearts, right? And, and to be clear, this is all we should want man's law to do, because man can't see the intents of the heart as well as God can. And so we should want judges who make decisions based on what actually happened. But, but even then it gets tricky because we all recognize that intentions matter, don't they? It doesn't always pan out. Intentions, intentions matter. Even as parents, we often have to figure out what our children intended to do um, and not just what they did. And it's often hard. But there's an ultimate judge who knows our hearts. He knows our intentions. He knows what we meant, which is both reassuring and terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> it's reassuring and terrifying. Uh, But the Lord our God wants more than just checklist Christianity. I did this, and I did this, and I did this. Therefore, I'm a good person. Look at me. No, no, no. No, he wants to transform our hearts. This is why the summary of the law doesn't point us to external behaviors, but to an internal reality. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and you see this, uh, and it's so important to see because a lot of people, they make a God out of external morality. Uh, it's moralistic deism. Uh, they'll often say, I, I try to be a good person. And you start talking to people about Jesus, and this is what you'll hear just time and again. If you ask them about what they believe, or whether they just say, well, I do my best, right? I try to be a good person. And they don't know exactly what to believe, but they believe that they should be good. (laughs) And so they try to be good, and they try to follow the golden rule. But the question, of course, is how good is good enough? How good is good enough? And who is qualified to judge whether we are good enough? And on what basis does the ultimate judge make his judgments? And just from these 10 commandments, and this last one, we know that God looks at more than the outward appearance. He sees to the very core of who we are. 
which means he knows why we need this command not to covet. And it's because we want other things. This is the confrontation, right? It, it should be so simple. Don't crave, don't yearn for what God has provided for, some, for someone else. It's a really simple command, isn't it? If someone else has it, don't yearn for it, don't crave it, don't try to take it from them. It's impossible. It's impossible because we all want other things. We really want them. If, if you had a nickel for every time your child told you they wanted something else other than what you've given them, you would have a lot more money to give them what they really wanted, right? Like, I mean, they always want something else. We always want something else. And, and we've seen this over and over again in the series. Our hearts are not naturally faithful. So we value other things in place of God, which is why we need his command to not have other gods before him and to not idolize something else in his place. And God was seeking to create a, a God-centered people. That's what God wants to make, a God-centered people. But we are naturally me-centered, right? The question of our hearts is always, what about me? So we have hearts that lust and hate and covet. And this is what led to the first sin in the garden, it wasn't Eve coveting a fruit. It was coveting the knowledge that the fruit promised to provide, which God had not provided. You'll be like God. You'll know good from evil. Craving something that God was supposedly keeping from them. And we have a propensity to look at our neighbor and see all the things that we wish God had given to us. Right? So someone else gets the promotion instead of me, right? And someone else finds love instead of me, and someone else enjoys a functional family at Christmas instead of me, and someone else gets good news from the doctor instead of me, and someone else goes on all these vacations that I look at on Facebook and Instagram, but what about me? Do we believe that if we needed more blessings in order to glorify God, that our God would provide them? It depends on when you ask, right? It depends on how good my life is going. It depends on if he's provided for what I've been asking him for lately. So, so, so what's, is, there, is there good news for us to see here? I, I want you to know that there is. Because this command isn't just calling us away from something. Do not covet. It's also calling us to something. And our lives are so much better when we see what the Bible is calling us to. So I want you to see the instruction, the positive side of this command that God does. And the positive side is, is this. God does not want us to constantly feel like we are lacking something. You know that? God does not want you to feel like you are perpetually lacking something else. I need this. I need this. I need this. And you have that feeling in your heart. God doesn't want you to live that way. God wants his children to learn to be content to learn to be content. So if your heart struggles with contentment, I have some very good news for you today. The Bible says, one, that you are not alone, and two, that you are not a lost cause, because contentment is learned. Uh, in, in Romans 7, 7 through 8, I don't have time to turn there right now. You could read that later. It'd be helpful. Paul admits to, at one time, having all kinds of covetousness, so have that in your mind. Paul is saying in Romans 7, 7 through 8, he says, I had all sorts of covetousness in my life. And with that in mind, because of the transformation of the gospel, look at what Paul says to the church at Philippi. This is Philippians 4, starting in verse 11. Paul, when he's thanking them for their gifts to him, he says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Because contentment is not a talent that some people are born with and others aren't. Contentment is something we all need to learn. He goes on in verse 12. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And are you ready for me to ruin a verse for athletes everywhere? Here we go. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That verse has nothing to do with scoring touchdowns or hitting three, or hitting three pointers or Holyfield defeating Tyson, even though he wore it on his jacket that day. Uh, it has nothing to do with any of those things. Paul is saying that through Christ, his 
contentment is not circumstantial. That's what Philippians 4.13 means. Pick a different verse to put on your basketball shoes, okay? Or on the eye black if you're playing football. That is not what that verse means. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, I can do all things through him who strengthens me is talking about contentment in all circumstances. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6.8, Paul says, If we have food and clothing, we will be content. <laughs> which, when you think about that verse, if, if we made a list of what we need to be happy, it would probably have more than two things on it, wouldn't it? <laughs> right? so think about it. What do you need to be happy? Your list probably needs, has more than food and clothing on it. And, and this is the deception of our hearts and the lie of the world. The Bible wants to warn you of this. The lie is more. Right? This is what the Bible warns us of, the lie of more. Our hearts say, if I just had a little bit more of this, if I, then I would be happy. Right? If I just had a little bit more money, a little better looks, a little more time. And the world says, yeah, and you deserve it. You deserve more. You deserve better. And our hearts say, I certainly deserve it more than that person. Right? I deserve it more than that guy. What gives? Jesus said, in Luke 12, 15, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Why? For one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 5 said, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So why? Should we be content with what we have? That verse says it's because God has promised to be with us. Because we have Jesus and he's enough. And I think that is what Paul had learned. The secret to contentment that I believe Paul had learned is that whether he had plenty or he had nothing, whether he was free or whether he was shackled in prison, he had learned that he could trust the promise that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us, that as long as he has Jesus, he has enough. And you see, we think, we think that we would be happy if we had our neighbor's life, right? or their family, or their physique, or their bank account. But true happiness is found when we have faith in the promises of God. If all of God's promises are true, we will never lack anything that we need. But that's easy to say sitting in church, isn't it? <laughs> it's so easy. We're sitting here. Yes, amen. If I, as long as I have Jesus, I have enough. But then we leave here and everything goes wrong. <laughs> We're like, what in the world's happening right now? What gives? Why, why is this? And we often feel like we are going to be lacking or that things would be so much better if we had this or that. This is why experience alone does not teach us contentment. If you want to learn to be content, you need more than just life experiences. Because for a lot of people, life experiences have taught them to be bitter and have taught them to be angry. You know, someone as they've gone through their life, they've become less content, not more. They become more bitter, more frustrated, more angry. I think we would all know someone like that. And, and we should ask ourselves, why, wh wh why is that, <laughs> right? Why is it that some people at the end of their life are just the sweetest, more, most content people you know, right? When you think about a content person, I often think about someone that's older and they are just thrilled to have a scoop of ice cream, right? And you're like, man, how are you so content with that? Or just the sweetest person, so many things are happening to them health-wise and they are just the sweetest people that you, that you know, they are so content. Why is it that some people, as they go through life experience, they become more and more content and other people, they go through the same life experiences and yet it leads them to be angry and bitter? I would say this, it's, it's because contentment is not not just learned by, through experience. Contentment is learned by experiencing God in our experiences. Contentment is not just learned through life experience. It's learned by experiencing God in our experiences. Experiencing over and over again that no matter what happens, that he is the one that satisfies, that he will never leave us or forsake us. When he is our shepherd, we will not lack which is why I want us to fix our attention on the ultimate promise 
that we should see in this command to not covet. Whether we are people who, who covet or people who are content hinges on whether we have experienced and trust the fullness of who Jesus is. This command to not covet was not intended to be an external law that restricts our behavior. The promise of the new covenant was that it would be written on our hearts. That this would not be foreign to us, but it would instead be who we are because of the transformation of the gospel. So in Exodus, we see God teaching his people that he's enough. Right, that he provides protection from the enemy and he provides water from the rock and bread from heaven. And that was all a preview of what Jesus was going to provide for us. Jesus came for people who felt like they were lacking, trying to fulfill their cravings in all of the wrong places. And he said, I'm living water. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one who satisfies. I am the one that your heart and that your soul are craving. It's all found in me. And then Jesus went to battle to defeat our greatest enemy, the enemy of our sin that had resoundingly defeated us. How good is good enough? How good is good enough? God's standard of righteousness is not whether we are better than other people. God's standard of righteousness is himself. And none of us can meet that standard. The law can't justify us because we can't keep the law. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I failed to live. And then he died the death that you and I deserve to die. He took the just punishment for all of our sin on himself at the cross. He rose from the dead. He conquered sin and the grave. And so if we come to the end of ourselves and place our faith instead in the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus, this is the promise of the gospel. All of your sins, all of them, past, present, and future, are forgiven. The righteousness of Jesus that you desperately need is credited to your account. You become part of the eternal family of God. The Holy Spirit indwells your life to transform you from the inside out. You will never be lacking because when, when you have Jesus, you have everything. You have everything that you truly need. He is the ultimate treasure. He is enough. He is full. And from his fullness, we receive grace upon grace. We're going to talk about that this Christmas season. Our desire for this series has been that our salvation would lead to our submission. We've, we've not been saved to go and do whatever we want. We've been saved so we can serve our Savior. And the reality is that we will submit to Christ when we find our satisfaction in Christ. I, I really believe that whether you follow Jesus with your life is determined about whether your true satisfaction is found in him or whether you believe it can be found somewhere else. Because when we don't believe that Jesus is enough, then submission to him will always feel like it's keeping us from what we really want. That this is why our children struggle to submit to us as parents, right? Because they think that we're keeping something from them. And they really want this and this and this. And if I ask, you're going to say no. And so I don't want to ask, right? right? And it's the same way in our relationship with God. If we think that Jesus is trying to keep us from things that we want more, that will satisfy us more, then we're really going to struggle with his instructions. We're really going to struggle to submit to him. But when we believe that Jesus is enough, then submission to him keeps us from all the counterfeits that threaten the satisfaction that can only be found in him. It doesn't keep us from all the things we want. It keeps us in what we really need and what we really want. God's law is good. His grace is even better. So let's submit to him because our satisfaction, our satisfaction is found in him. Let's learn to be content together. As we go through all the different life experiences, let's learn that Jesus is enough. He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen, church? Let me pray for us and give you an opportunity to respond to God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how you've revealed yourself to us. And thank you that you don't just want our external 
obedience. You want our hearts. So Jesus, you came to transform the core of who we are and make it submissive to you. So I pray that we would believe that satisfaction is found nowhere else, that fulfillment and joy and contentment is found nowhere else. It's only found in Jesus. Uh, We're so thankful for the young men who have placed their faith in Christ and want to follow you with their lives. Uh, I I pray for Victor. I pray for Tyler, uh, that they would find their satisfaction in you and they would submit to your leading and that you would use them for your honor and glory. And I pray that the same for the rest of us. Uh, that especially as we go into this highly commercialized time of year, uh, that we would remember the true treasure of Christmas is Jesus. So thank you for the gift that supplies us with everything that we need. I pray that we would be content with what we have because we know that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.